Okay, folks, let's get this going. My name is Jerry Vasky. I'm one of the uh, co-chairs for the conference. Uh, on behalf of my other co-chairs, Dr. Michael Manfredo sitting down here, Dr. Natalie, Ms. Natalie Sexton sitting back there, I'd like to welcome all of you to the Fifth International Pathway Symposium. Whenever you do five iterations of anything, you know you're doing something right. And I think we've done several things right in terms of getting to where we are right now. First thing, first reason is our, our co-sponsors, agencies such as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the, our publisher, Taylor and Francis, the Organization of Wildlife Planners, Responsive Management, and universities such as the University of Ohio State and, and Kansas State. Um, all of those folks have made generous contributions to us financially, and we appreciate that greatly. Not all of our sponsors, however, give us money. Uh, two of our sponsors use something else as currency. Odell's Brewery, for example, donated six kegs of beer, and New Belgium Brewery, both in Fort Collins, donated 13 cases of beer. There's a reason why our socials are as social as they are. Uh, this is the um, second reason Pathways works is because of the people behind the scenes. I'd like to acknowledge and thank uh, Linda Sawyers, Wes White, Kaylin Clements, Will Hardwick, and Esther Duke. These are the people that make this conference happen. Mike and I and Natalie get up on occasion and talk, but it's these people that, that make this happen, and we appreciate their efforts totally. The third reason that Pathways is a success, I think, is because of all of you. I go to a fair number of conferences throughout each year, and this is the only one that I go to where I want to see every presentation. I want to be in every session. That's not true of most conferences I go to. So thank you for all your brilliant ideas, and we appreciate you, you being here today. This is the first Pathways Conference in the United States in three years. In 2016, uh, the conference was in Kenya, Africa. In January 2018, the Pathways will be in Namibia, Africa. Lor uh, Dr. Lori Marker will be co-hosting that with us. Thank you, Lori. We appreciate that. She will make a few remarks at the end of her plenary talk tomorrow morning. In September of 2018, the conference will be in Germany. Dr. Ike van Ruschkowski will be co-hosting that Pathways. Ike will also say a few words tomorrow morning uh, in the uh, plenary session. So we are gratified this year that this year's conference has representatives from 23 different countries. We have approximately 270 speakers or attendees and 175 unique presentations. Uh, those of you who have attended Pathways in the past know that one of the unique characteristics of this conference is the number of representatives we get each year from agency types. Uh, this year was no different than the past. We have attracted 51 different agencies worldwide. Another feature of Pathways is the trainings that we offer. This year we had a a three-day session called Human Dimensions Foundations of Natural Resource Conservation. 33 people attended that training workshop, and from what Natalie just told me, it sounded like it went off pretty well. So I'd like to move on, but before I do that, I do have one announcement to make. Um, today is Aaliyah Deach's birthday, so if you see Aaliyah anywhere, make sure you congratulate her. Uh, and with that, I would like to introduce our first plenary speaker, this afternoon, uh, Mr. Dan Ash. Dan is President and Chief Executive Office of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, also known as AZA. The AZA is an association of 232 zoos and science centers uh, that seeks to achieve the highest standards of animal care, education, and conservation. Dan is responsible for, the, for advancing the organization's vision, mission, and strategic priorities. Dan joined AZA in January of 2017 after serving as director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for nearly six years. Uh, in that agency, he also held a number of professional staff positions, including assistant director for external affairs, chief of the National Wildlife Refuge System, and science advisor to, to the director and deputy director. Dan earned a bachelor's degree in, in biological sciences at Florida State University and a graduate degree in marine affairs from the University of Washington. Dan, welcome to Pathways.
Thank you very much, Jerry. <clears throat> Getting all my equipment squared away here. <clears throat> all right, well, good evening. You guys are like church. Everybody's kind of in the back. Afraid we're going to ask you for a contribution. Um, all right, well, it is a pleasure to be here with you in this um, incredibly beautiful surroundings, although for me it will be short. Um, and as Jerry said, I, I have spent my entire professional career, 35 years, um, in the conservation profession. I, um, with the good graces of the National Sea Grant College program, I left the University of Washington in 1982 and went to Washington, D.C. for one year on a fellowship, and that was 35 years ago. Um, I spent 13 years on Capitol Hill working for what used to be the Committee on Merchant Marine and Fisheries, and then 22 years with the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, and as Jerry said, the last nearly six as, as the Fish and Wildlife Service Director. I've, in fact, I've, I spent my entire life um, around the conservation profession because my father worked for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service for 37 years, so I literally grew up in and around this conservation profession. <clears throat> and uh, now I'm the president and chief executive officer of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, which is the gold standard accrediting organization within the zoological profession. I could spend my time today talking about our saving animals from extinction or safe initiative and our commitment through that program to commit more than one billion dollars to support field conservation in the next five years. Or I could talk about our 196 million uh, annual visitors and how we plan to engage and empower and inspire them to conserve animals in nature. And I thought about doing that and by all rights I probably should do that. Um, but then I thought that I would talk to you about other things. If you want to talk about um, me and AZA and our 230 member institutions, then you can ask me a question um, after or I'll be around this evening and you can ask me. Um, but tonight I want to take your time to talk about conservation writ large and, and to be a little bit provocative about why you are here and what you are doing. So before I do that, though, I want to applaud this group and this gathering and the leadership behind it. I want to thank you for what you have done to advance our field and what you will do to advance it further in the months and the years ahead. I'm very proud to see my former agency as a sponsor of this uh, Pathways Conference. It's important to say that because I think what I'm about to say while I'm up here um, may sound provocative. It likely will sound critical, and in important ways, it's intended to be critical. I looked at the Pathways website uh, preparing for these remarks and saw them, that the mission is to increase professionalism and effectiveness in the human dimensions of the fisheries and wildlife management field. Really? Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. How many of you in the room were old enough to vote in the 1991 U.S. presidential election? That is what is so great about this profession. You can always count on some old people in the room. <laughs> Um, well, if you're too young to remember that, or you're not from the United States, that election pitted an incumbent establishment Republican, George H.W. Bush, the father of George W. Bush, against an upstart New Age Democrat, William Jefferson Clinton, the governor of Arkansas. Bill Clinton's campaign man manager was a KG fellow named James Carville. Have you ever seen James Carville on TV? He kind of looks like an alien. 
Um, he has an amazing capacity to put politics in simple and very understandable terms. Like, as an aside, both my kids went to college in Pennsylvania. My daughter went to uh, Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, and my son went to Bloomsburg University, a small state college right smack dab in the middle of Pennsylvania. And when Barack Obama was running for re-election in 2011, um, both my kids were in college at the time. And uh, I saw James Carville on TV with a bunch of other political pundits, and they were prognosticating about Pennsylvania, a swing state, and what's going to happen, and who's going to win, and who's ahead, and who's behind, and who's got momentum. And James Carville kind of interrupted them all and said, you, you all, if you're going to talk about Pennsylvania, you need to understand Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is Pittsburgh in the west and Philadelphia in the east and a big old hunk of Alabama in the middle. <laughs> My son was going to school in Alabama. <clears throat> but I digress. Um, back, back to 1991. James Carville defined what was, at first, the unofficial and then the very official and defining political message of Bill Clinton's successful campaign to become President of the United States. It's the economy, stupid. That was a reminder to campaign workers and to voters that everything, all the issues, all the passion, all the politics came back to one central truth, the economy. It's the economy, stupid. It wasn't intended to be an insult. It was intended to be a reminder. So okay, back, back to here and now. Your mission in gathering here together is to increase the professionalism and the effectiveness in the human dimensions of fisheries and wildlife conservation. Human dimensions, really? I think if James Carville were speaking here, standing at this podium, instead of me, he'd look out at all of you and he would say four words. It is the human stupid. That's five words. <clears throat> it is the humans. Why do we talk about human dimensions in the fish and wildlife management profession? What exactly are the non-human dimensions? of fish and wildlife conservation. I still believe that the dominant ecological force on this planet is photosynthesis. But humans and human ecology are giving old photosynthesis a run for her money. Today we are seven and a half billion strong. That is 4.7 billion more people than existed when I was born in 1956. And we're on our way to more than 11 billion by the end of this century. Another three and a half billion people. And as the Fish and Wildlife Service people in the room have heard me say, it's not just the number of people, it's their affluence. When I was born, 32% of the world's 2.8 billion people lived in cities, 32%. Today, 55% of the 7.5 billion people on the planet live in cities. And in the U.S., it's over 80% of people that live in cities. And city living has two important consequences. Increasing consumption and a widening disconnection from the resources that support that consumption, what we might call nature or the natural world. So in the future, there are going to be more and more people, and they're going to be more and more affluent. They're going to be more and more like us. They're going to have more access to electricity and education and transportation and health care and affordable and abundant food and water more and more of the planet's ecological space will be dedicated to humans and human ecology. And that means, unfortunately, less and less for the rest of what we call biological diversity. Again, 
It's the humans, stupid. So what are we going to do about it? Fortunately, we designed something called conservation. But it is absolutely essential for people in our line of work to understand that conservation is a human construct based in human values and a sense that our existence is threatening the well-being and the prosperity of future generations of humans, our children and grandchildren. Yes, yes, we do care about the animals and to some degree the plants. But let's be honest, it really is about us. It's the humans. An icon of the modern conservation movement, former President Theodore Roosevelt said it very well. We should not forget that it will be just as important to our descendants to be prosperous in their time as it is to us to be prosperous in our time. If James Carville had worked for TR, he would have added four words at the end of that quote. It's the humans, stupid. In fact, while we're on the subject, science itself is a human enterprise. I think we often treat science as if it's some automated, bloodless process of aggregating data from which clear and convincing conclusions emerge, but um, mostly and especially in the world of conservation science, it occurs on very difficult terrain. It, um, where data is elusive and the signals and the conclusions are quite ambiguous. What I found as director of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service is that the human subspecies, Homo sapiens politicus, or politicians as we affectionately call them, have long ago figured this out. We have good science, which is that body of knowledge that supports my conclusion, and we have bad science, which is the knowledge that does not. Again, it's the humans. Stupid. Two examples uh, from right here in the Rocky Mountain region uh, during my tenure as U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service director, I think, illustrate these points. In late 2011 and through most of 2012, we fought what I call a bison range war. Um, a guy named Brian Schweitzer was then governor of Montana, a Democrat. Governor Schweitzer had a vision which I and the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, supported. He wanted to restore bison to a greater portion of Montana's broader landscape and perhaps more importantly deal with the thorny political issue of surplus and potentially brucellosis infected bison coming out of Yellowstone National Park and onto adjoining ranches. He needed a place to park these bison until they could be tested and certified as brucellosis free and he settled on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Bison Range as a perfect storage and testing area. But there was one big problem well, there were a lot of big problems with that, but one big problem. The Bison Range is a national wildlife refuge, and it already has a mission to manage a conservation herd of bison. So what do you do if you're Governor Schweitzer? You seize on the all-important goal of genetic purity. You see, the, the scientists and the science surrounding bison conservation had become obsessed with genetic purity. The Yellowstone bison, even though many people would say they haven't been rigorously tested, are considered to be genetically pure. National bison range bison have, on average, about a 2% cattle gene introgression, <clears throat> not pure, even though they have a higher genetic diversity. So if you're the governor, you attack the bison range herd as mongrel bison, which he did quite frequently and quite vociferously and quite effectively. 
and you attack the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and its director as standing in the way of scientific bison management. Your facts are your truth. Never mind that this genetic purity has no bearing on phenotype or behavior or fitness. The bison don't know it. Genetic purity is a completely human value construct. And I found it kind of especially interesting, amusing, although the governor didn't think so, um, and even perhaps a bit hypocritical coming from a species whose genealogy exhibits between two and 6% introgression from Neanderthals. <clears throat> we are mongrels, are we not? So truth be told, it was never really about the bison to begin with. It was about the ranchers, about brucellosis, about the fact that Yellowstone National Park cannot control or contain its bison herd. And that's not about Yellowstone bison. It's about the humans. I could talk about something closer to home, like reintroducing Wolverine to Rocky Mountain National Park or Mexican or Rocky Mountain wolf recovery or something big like greater sage grouse and the, and the sage grouse or the sage steppe ecosystem or something global like rhinoceros and wildlife trafficking, all the same. But let's go back to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and talk about grizzly bear. Grizzly bear in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is really a remarkable uh, story of conservation success. Fewer than 150 bears remained when they were added to the endangered species list in 1974. Today, there are more than a thousand. And the ecosystem is at or above its carrying capacity for grizzly bear. It's exporting bears. And when it exports bears, it exports human bear conflict. At the end of the Obama administration, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service proudly proposed to delist this population of grizzly bear, which would return bear management outside of the national parks to the states of Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. We faced a torrent of opposition. Frankly, most of it based in concern that the bears, once they were delisted, would be subject to trophy hunting. And especially so-called celebrity bears that could potentially be hunted were they to roam outside of the parks, which they sometimes do. What's a celebrity bear, anyway? They don't name Yellowstone bears, but it's because they're one of the world's most studied population of animals. Conveniently, scientists have given them, given them numbers so people put stickers on their car, you know, proclaiming, I saw a bear 399, I saw a bear 610. So if you took out your iPhone right here and all, all you have to do is Google bear 399 and up will pop a, a plethora of photos and posts and tweets and information about bear 399 and, and the latest happenings with her her new set of cubs. So for sure, it's about the bears. To achieve recovery, we need to understand their biology and the ecology of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. But frankly, when push comes to shove, it's, it's about we, the people. Our view of theirs, our view of the science, our social tolerance, our aspirations for future generations of humans. I think this was expressed quite clearly and eloquently by a great friend and a great public servant, Yellowstone National Park Superintendent Dan Wink. Dan said he believes that the bears are recovered and are ready to be removed from the endangered species list, but he worries that too many bear deaths could affect the experience of the thousands of park visitors 
who come to see grizzlies. It's the humans, stupid. So all of this means that your work and your purpose and mission in gathering here to increase professionalism and effectiveness in our profession is so very vital. But what I want to challenge you about is please don't fall into this trap that our profession seems to be setting. There is nothing called human dimensions of fish and wildlife conservation. It's all about the humans. Conservation is a human enterprise. If it weren't for human beings, the animals would be just fine. We wouldn't have to worry about conserving them. We made up conservation. It's our societal guilt and our debt to future generations. It's the human, stupid. So by allowing this false narrative to continue, we provide aid and comfort to a significant portion of our profession who like nothing more than to blissfully work on non-human dimensions of conservation. As if there were such a thing. It's a fiction. It was created to make us feel comfortable when we ignore what makes conservation very uncomfortable. The people. And it's running rampant in our profession. I looked up a few things Preparing for this, the North American Bird Conservation Initiative has a human dimension subcommittee. The Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies has a human dimensions committee. Among more than 20 other committees in WAFWA, which are presumably non-human dimensions, like regulations, law enforcement, legislation, and private lands. Those are non-human dimensions of conservation. I think that, well, and apologies to Colorado State, which has a Department of Human Dimensions uh, of Natural Resources Management. Um, and, but, you know, my very own beloved U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, has branches of human dimensions and Human Dimension Portals and the National Conservation Training Center just led a, a course in Human Dimensions here. Um, and I don't mean to uh, belittle um, your efforts um, because um, I'm sure that um, most or all of you see this as success and in many respects it is. But what I, what I posit to you is that it is a dangerous trend in our profession to stovepipe this thing that we call human dimensions. So that if I'm uncomfortable with that, I can say, well, those human dimension people are going to take care of that. I'm just the wolf guy. And my job is just to run the reintroduction program. I don't need to worry about what those farmers and ranchers and other people are going to think about that. That's your job. Um, so you can deal with those people. I'm just the recovery guy. Um, uh, so until we call it out, and unless we call it out, it's going to continue and it's going to get worse. You're going to be isolated. And it will be a barrier to our success and it will make an already improbable task even more so. So please excuse me for, I relied on, on Bill Clinton and his campaign slogan here. And I do not believe for a second that anyone in this room is stupid. If you're attending this conference, then you are thinking about and doing 
and leading conservation and conservation science the way that it must be viewed and done and led as a human endeavor, full of human emotion and value and bias and fear and anger and aspiration. It's messy and it's hard. And as the world adds another three and a half billion people, city dwelling, consumptive, disconnected, affluent, and people, it will only become messier and harder. But success depends upon treating it that way, as a human endeavor in its entirety, not something that can be divided into human and non-human. It's the human, stupid. You need to say that to your professional community, my professional community. That should be your clarion call. It is the human, stupid. Don't push me in a corner and say, oh, that's the human dimension of wildlife conservation. It's all about humans. You hold the key. Stop the false narrative. Stop it here. It is the humans. If we don't get our profession to embrace this, then we may one day earn the word stupid. Thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions or hear any comments. Come on, you got to be angry about that. Somebody does. Yes. Thank you, that was very productive. Very interesting. Um, can you, um, obviously, you've talked about how we kind of isolated ourselves into committees and um, our own little field of people where we talk amongst each other, but how do we get it to a point where, um, what would you recommend, aside from going to somebody's office and say, it's human stupid, what would you <laughs> recommend as steps that we could take to get the leaderships of our organizations to embrace kind of the human dimensions concepts that we talk about here and actually integrate those more fully into the programs that we all work on. So it's not an isolated thing, but it's something that is everywhere. Yeah, I, I think that, um, well, I think we, I, we just have to start a conversation because my sense is for the last decade plus that um, we've been seeing this as progress and I think it has been progress to get people to focus on this thing that we're calling human dimensions. But it's kind of like um, communications, that we segregate communication. And it's like, oh, external affairs is responsible for that. Um, and, and it's kind of re it's repeating history a bit we built this profession around stovepiped disciplines, right? We split the world into fish and wildlife and range and um, forest and ocean and, and, we, and we made progress. But the challenge of our generation and probably the next generation of conservation is just trying to pull all that back together, right? Because we can't look at the world as forest and range and ocean and river and um, fish and wildlife. Um, and we can't look at it as human and non-human or communication and sociology or biology or ecology. Um, we have to look at it together. And so organization is not bad um, to have a group of dedicated people thinking about this. But I think what you need to do as professionals is make sure that that integration is happening, number one. And Number two, you have to make sure that you're not being pushed into a corner, that uh, establishing a committee on human dimensions is not just a way to uh, you know, give those people something to do. Um, and I think sometimes it is, because we've got other things to worry about and, um, than, and bigger problems than that. Um, so I would say begin a dialogue within all of these venues, within the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, within 
the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, within the Wildlife Management Institute. I think we need to begin a dialogue and we have to stop this stove piping because I think, I think it's not healthy for you um, um, as, a, as a segment of this profession. And I would say begin a dialogue. All right. Oh, yes. Back here. Ben, the, the, the AGA, in a generation ago, zoos were largely seen by biologists as kind of uh, animal jails. Mm -hmm. And the AGA has really transformed itself into a, conservation, into a conservation entity. And so they really are pretty expert at really transforming that vision. I'm wondering in the six months you've been in this role, what have you learned about how to build it off. Well, there's, I mean, they're still in the process of that transformation and pulling that off, but um, they've done it by this process of accreditation, which is pretty amazing. I mean, they've essentially regulated themselves. And in order to be a member of AZA, you have to be accredited by AZA. And um, so they built a very independent, objective, standards-based process to accredit themselves. Um, and we have an accreditation commission, which is I said, an independent function. Um, and they've set standards for themselves. And they define that vision that a modern zoological institution isn't just a kind of well-run menagerie. It's a, it, it, it exists for a purpose. And that purpose is to engage and inspire people um, to love and to care for animals, animals in they're in human care and animals that are in nature. And, um, and so that process is, that evolution is still happening. They, they've set goals for themselves, like 3% of operational dollars uh, should be going to support field conservation. And on, on its face, 3% doesn't sound like a lot, but if we can get to 3%, then collectively our members will be pushing probably more than a billion and a half dollars into field conservation over the next five years. Um, and so they're constantly assessing standards, raising standards, asking themselves uh, to do more. But it's, it's basically built around that vision that, that they have their mission, their mission organizations. They're not just attractions where people go to have a good, a good time and to be entertained, that they exist for a purpose. And I'm, it, it's inspiring, actually, to see. I was just at Indianapolis Zoo. And the Indianapolis, the mission of the Indianapolis Zoo um, says nothing about running a zoo. It talks about conserving animals and inspiring and engaging communities to care about and, and conserve nature. Um, and, uh, and that is the, essentially the prototype of a, of a modern AZA accredited zoo and aquarium. So look for a lot more out of this community. They can do a lot more and they, they need to do a lot more. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.